for you to return to the character of Theon after such a torturous run as Reek? Um, I'd say it was it was definitely a challenge. Um, I'd say that he wasn't really kind of stepping into the, the Theon that he was before he, he was turned into Reek. Um, but yeah, he's just, uh, he's had definitely a crazy arc of many of the characters on the show. He's just been one of the, the craziest, but it's um, it's just been enjoyable, you know, to be able to sort of find empathy for a character. So it's awesome. Thank you, Alfred. Connor, <laughs> we've never actually had an opportunity to act together, which is terrible. Um, many of your fellow cast cite how difficult it can be to keep them laughing while filming with you. Do you purposely make them laugh? No. And is there an actor who makes you laugh? Uh, they all make me laugh. <laughs> and sometimes they know it, but mostly they don't. But they make me laugh a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's some pretty funny people in the cast, I'm sure, not you. <laughs> Jacob! Hello. Hi. Is it true uh, that we've seen Grey Worm being a bit flirtatious with the Sendai? Do you see a future for them? I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's already there's things firing between them. There's, there's, there's chemistry, right? I think. Um, <laughs> I, I want those kids to be happy. I want them to find happiness with each other. Everything's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's ever going to be happy. You know, that's <laughs> but do you think Daenerys would approve of that relationship? Yeah. I think she, she'd like, she'd do the wedding. She'd like, but you don't call a wedding, do you? Not bingo. But she'd, uh, yeah, I think she'd be involved.
and I, I hope we get to see it blossom more and maybe there might be a happy ending for them. I, I daren't say it, just in case. <laughs> uh, As a death. Yeah, I know my Sam has always considered himself a bit of an outsider. Yeah. Have Gilly and baby Sam given him a sense of belonging? I didn't write these, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's absolutely always been an outsider. He was an outsider from the day he was born at home <coughs> because his father considered him to be such a disappointment and treated him with such contempt. Then he was removed to Castle Black where he was an outsider again. And then he said, well, the one place I can be really accepted is the Citadel. That's the one place I can go where my passions and interests aren't treated with scorn and contempt. They're the place where uh, it's a place where people have an understanding and appreciation of knowledge. And and this is going to be the place where I feel accepted for the first time in my life. Gets there, he's just as much as an outsider there as he is anywhere else. Because they make him do all those jobs that you saw him do. <laughs> and and it, it's interesting that People say, how is him being at the Citadel going to affect his relationship with Gilly? Given the fact that they've grown so close over the years, but that was when Sam didn't have thousands and thousands of books as a distraction from his relationship. So I think that, that as time has gone on, Sam has worked out, as a lot of people work out in relationships, that your, your kind of sphere of interest shrinks, and you no longer want to be necessarily accepted by a wider world or even a wider community, because you know what's important, and important is being loved by two people rather than accepted by hundreds. This is a very important question. Do you miss me? <laughs> Yeah. Sophie. This is 
really tough, the first thing that comes to mind is just like unlimited carbohydrates. <laughs> Selected outlets all over Westeros, there should be free Dornish wine for all the inhabitants of oh, Westeros. Yeah. You're welcome. I think Sunday would probably want, and I'm quite like, you know, language lessons for everyone. It's normally bilingual and cool. <laughs> Education for everyone. So that's a really serious answer, but also true how I feel. Clean up their own stick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've set up a, a holiday scheme for all the characters who have only filmed in the cold places to go and film in the warm places. <laughs> Scares him. 
I think the economic outlook. <laughs> and I, we, well, something, whatever that sorcerer said, we, you know, we saw him with a red priestess. We were, it was one of the few times where he looked a bit, what? Because she was cray. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think that's, that's you know, he's, he, he survived so much, but that's the one thing we don't know what was said. And, and because of your experience with, you know, words and hold the door and everything, I think, oh God, I'm going to be holding a door for someone. <laughs> and that's what the sorcerer said. So that's the only thing I'm kind of, you know, there's yeah. some mystery there that I still don't know what that's about, what was said, and what it means. Well, my advice when it comes to holding doors is don't. Or, uh, or get a, a swing door. Yeah. <laughs> it never ends well. Jacob. Yes. Yeah. Some of you, some of you right there, may know Jacob is also a very talented musician. Thank you. How do you balance both sides of your career? Um, I, I kind of don't. I have like I'm really lucky <laughs> um, that I've, I've got like we, the way we shoot the show is kind of over a period. I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> the way we shoot the show is it's like it's like six months and then we're all kind of in and out, kind of revolving doors. Sorry, it was a <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so I just whenever I'm not in Belfast or. Or a sunny place. Um, Rub it in, man. Just yeah. talk about doors, <laughs> talk about the sunshine. <laughs> right, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not been too bad, actually. It's not been hard. I mean, it could, my, my life could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm really place. nervous, by the way. This is like, I'm, I'm at home here, but for some reason I'm already nervous. Why don't you just have a bit more song? Um, what song do you want to hear? Uh, uh, that one. Oh, not one of my songs. You're already here with my songs. Oh, okay. I thought it might calm your nerves. Uh, okay. Calm your nerves. Calm your nerves. Beautiful. Every time. Is that you shut me up? I was about to go into like a. a um, medley. Yeah, medley. medley. I just, that was just anal voice, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Calm your nerves. laughs> Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know, I know what it's about. I know what it's about balancing two careers. I was, I was like actually DJing until like two AM last night. I don't balance. I just, I just do it. Yeah, you do it. You just do it. Yeah. Sophie. Hi. Hi. Does Sansa retain any of her ideas about love, marriage, and being happy, or is she now of the opinion that men are just after her for what she can get or what they can get? Uh, I don't think, um, I don't think she's like season one Sansa and she's particularly looking for, she's not really looking for a relationship or love at the moment, I think she's kind of done with that. Um, I think, you know, she's always on the search for happiness, but she doesn't really see the world through rose tinted glasses anymore, you know. Um, she sees the reality of the situation. In terms of like seeing men um, in a different light, I think she sees the world in a different light. I don't think men in particular. I think she. <laughs> what? Because that man's hurt. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, she's, you know, she's just kind of, she's woke now, guys. She's real woke. Um, you know, uh, she's cautious. She trusts no one, um, whether it be man or woman. Whether a family member or not, she trusts no one, and I think that's important uh, when you play the game of friends. <laughs> Liam. Yes. Do you think Davos misses his smuggling days uh, when life is simpler and he is able to live by his wits? Yeah, that's a kind of an interesting question because him being promoted from small time criminal to uh, being sucked into this web, this game. There's very little room. I think it reflects real life. People end up in powerful positions. It's, it, you can't have a simple life anymore. It's very difficult to be just happy. You're playing games. You're 
paranoid. He was out the gate with the whole, the whole thing. But I think he feels he has a responsibility to be there to try and keep whoever it may be on the right track. Um, because he's decent and he's loyal and he, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, have that addiction for this horrible drug that is power. So his, his head is kind of, his head is a, a little bit clearer than some. Um, but I, I do, I, I do like the guys. I, I love the guys' simplicity. It's he, he is who he is, and he's he's not a complicated character. And uh, it's really nice to do that. It's really nice to play somebody like that and play those little colours. All that. I really, I really love this character. I think that's one of the special things about George R. R. Martin's writing that every single character, even no matter how small they are, is completely multi-layered. We all get such a it's a great. What do you mean small? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I don't mean you. I only have one word. I don't think I can any compete. Hello. <laughs> anyway, Natalie. We know that Masinda owes a debt to Daenerys as she freed her from slavery. Do you think Daenerys should have made Masinda her hand instead of Tyrion? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know about that. That would be cool. Um, I'd love to play that. But I think, you know, Tyrion knows the enemy. He is much more experienced with being a hand. He, and that sort of political landscape. I think Masande has come from a completely different world. She's been dealing with a completely different set of dangers. But, like, she, you know, this sort of strategizing and negotiating this very cutthroat world all of a sudden is, is, is so new. So I think Tyrion is probably the better candidate for hand. I fully support him in that role. Although it would be super cool to be like hand to like your bestie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like girl power, you know, double team, like really fun. I think you would have been an awesome hand actually. Oh well thank you. Maybe it's thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> John, mm -hmm. when Samuel was a member of the Night's Watch, yeah. Jon Snow was his constant protector. Yeah. How much of an influence do you think Jon still held over him? And how much does Samuel want to please Jon? Um, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Sam arrived at Castle Black uh, completely bereft of any positive male role model in his life. And indeed, the positive female role model that he had had been very cruelly taken away from him. So what he found in Jon Snow in that moment was everything he possibly needed all kind of wrapped up in one person. He was, he was a big brother, he was, a, he was a father figure, he was a confidant, he was a best friend. He was all those things. And Sam knew what it was like to be saved by somebody. He knew what it was like to be saved by Jon Snow and knew what it was like to have somebody take the burden of you on their shoulders. And when he found Gilly, he found somebody in even more kind of emotional dire straits than he was, who had a life of systematic sexual abuse laid out in front of her, and the, the worst possible life you could imagine. So he knew what it was like to be saved at that point. So he wanted to do that for somebody else. He wanted to, he wanted to save this girl and her son because he knows how important that can be. It was like John handed the baton on to Sam. And, and, Jon Snow was kind of everything to Sam, and now they've, they've gone on their separate paths because Sam wants to please him so much because he wants to fight the same battle as Jon Snow. He wants to stand shoulder to shoulder with Jon Snow in the Great War, but he knows that he can't do that on the battlefield. He knows that he has to do that using his very unique set of skills, which is academia and learning <coughs> and applying knowledge. You know, he, the Citadel is his battlefield. And so Jon sent him there, and now he has, he has the responsibility to make John's faith in him justify it and get John results. He knows it's a race against time. He needs to get in there, find out whatever piece of information he needs to find out, get back up to the north and give it to John Snow. That's that's what he and he feels that responsibility all the time. He he knows he's got a huge debt to repay to John. And he feels that very strongly and fingers crossed that he does just that, right? Yeah. I think in certain spiritual traditions, the third eye refers to the gate that leads to inner realms 
and spaces of higher consciousness. Do you think that applies to the three eyed raven? It's all about the raven. Uh, yeah, I, I think in many ways it does because I, I've always said that if I could have any superpower, it would be to be all knowing, and that's exactly what Bran is now. Um, he's he's learned with the original three eyed raven, and now he has access to like this vast encyclopedia of all of history. Um, and not only can you just read someone's perspective of it, he can actually exist there in that time and, and watch it happen. So. If that's not one of the deepest and, and most interesting realms there is, then, I, then I'm not sure what, what, what is. Thank you, Andy. Okay, before I open the floor for questions from you guys, I'm going to ask another few questions of the group. This is obviously very important, this question. Gwendolyn, if there were one character, Hodor, that <laughs> you went magnificent presence in the series who happens to be hosting this panel. <laughs> and also Captain Star. <laughs> Big answer, real answer. <laughs> Alfie. Um, who would I like to be brought back to life? Yeah, pretty much. Um, oh, uh, I would say... Carl Drogo. I like Carl Drogo. Gwendolyn, 
啊，现在热线的时候，反正有人 X 的时候，收费，他觉得很安慰。After so much time working on Game of Thrones, are you ready to act in a comedy, rom-com, or a musical? How would you like to act or direct? Or? Uh, I feel like Game of Thrones incorporates rom-com, musical, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I like the dark, um, gritty stuff, but I, uh, I don't know if I could do comedy after all this. I'm in a very dark place in my life. <laughs> yeah, second that, she is. <laughs> Let's see. Alfie. Yes. Would you like to be in a rom com or would you like to act and direct? Or I know you love know. nothing more than to be in a rom com. Nothing more. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, to, to just any, anything that comes my way, not even, um, you know, I, I'll, just, I'll just, you know, take anything on. Uh, but yeah, directing is something that would definitely interest me without doubt. Yeah. Cool, man. When? I'm desperate to do it. <laughs> Please, someone put me in a musical. Yeah. A kind of Arlena Dietrich, kind of gender bending, sort of song and dance. Cabaret, I think. Maybe. Um, if I ask this question, I'll, I'll prerequisite. I, I won't ask you to prove it, but can you sing? Can she sing? I don't know this, I don't know the answer. So. That, the jury's out on that small aspect of doing a musical. <laughs> but I hear they can do all sorts of technology these days. <laughs> oh, miming. Okay. Isaac. I'd like to be in Game of Thrones, the comedy rom-com musical. <laughs> It would just be a comedy rom-com musical. Uh, what more well, do you need? Come out behind the door and like tap dance. Yeah, I mean you can have all sorts of different musical numbers. It's it's ripe for a musical adaptation. Shall we do it? Yeah. <laughs> Dave and Dan. We're just the people to do it. You play the piano, I play the guitar. What? There are so Yeah, we've got like a whole band here actually. <laughs> John. Um, when I was 13 years old. I played Potiphar, the plum roll of Potiphar, in uh, Joseph and His Amazing Technical Dreamcoat at school. Couldn't sing then, can't sing now. Absolutely stormed it somehow then. Nice. It's, it'd be interesting to see how standards have risen over time. <laughs> I'd be interested in reprising my iconic role as Potiphar on the London stage for a hefty old fee. <laughs> Liam. Uh, I'd love to do some comedy. I did, I did a lot of comedy on stage before I started this television business. Um, but I met Peter Dinklage. Pe Peter Dinklage was asked, uh, what did he think, how do you think the last episode should go? And uh, he thinks the last episode of the entire show should be a musical. <laughs> that is a brilliant idea. We're, we're breaking the norms with television. Let's go that way. Let's finish with a high kicking number. Around the front. Why not? I'd watch it. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to ask. It's a danger of doing it this way. I've forgotten who I've asked. Come on. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a rest and let other people uh, do rom coms, comedies, and. What's the other one? Yeah, it was oh, no, they're not getting me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've done it all. Good night. Yeah, I want to make films. But. Um, that what? wasn't that wasn't an option, Ron Carl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 I'm like super greedy. I want to do everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's quite. This is quite a hard show to follow. Like, what do you do? I, I'm a like master spearsman now. This is hard. <laughs> and I, so I just want to do like hard things. So I guess like a comedy or a wrong com would be quite hard. I do want to, you know, because there's, there's talk of spin-offs in the show. I just want to put my hat in the ring now and just say, I really like the idea. I've been talking to Daniel Portman, the first part, and we've been talking about a sort of side call to the show where Grey Worm and Pod and maybe Darren Harris. Um, a 
Cyborg. Cyborg. Oh. It's like, so, so when you're not sitting. Cyborg. But you get like cameos, like Brienne would come in and like. Okay. As a cyborg? As a cyborg. Sure. Let's go with the cyborg cool. version. I want the cyborg version. <laughs> Borg in Vain Westeros. Could we do that? <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, I can announce that the uh, HBO spin-off has already been decided. It's going to be called Better Call Davos. No. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm sort of open to all things. I, I, I don't like to be absolute about anything. Like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that because you never know what comes into your, you know email inbox, you know, you're like, oh, that's a good script, or that would be a fun thing to do. I actually started off doing musicals, um, so I am so open to doing a musical. Whether I can sing as well as I should, I mean, oh, you know, but I'd give it a go. And, you know, other stuff, like, I'd love to, I, I've always sort of attempting to write things, and I'd love to be behind the camera too, so I'm sort of just, like, going with the flow. Awesome. I think we've had some really good ideas for a, a Borg musical <laughs> in Westeros, and I'm going to start working on that right away. And now we're going to open up the floor to you guys, which is the most important part of the panel, I think. Gorgeous! Oh my god, I wanted to ask a sexy question, but I couldn't think of one. So my question is, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, Hodor needs to come back as a white walker, uh, and my question is, does anyone have any costume problems that they hate a part of their costume so much, other than Isaac not being able to stand up ever? Um, uh, so I, I hate that part of his costume. <laughs> I, I've definitely had to just um, be sewn into my costumes, which is really problematic when you need the bathroom. So, as every time you need to go, you have to be like cut out and then. Well, it isn't easy for us to cut you out. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> he that has to cut her out. <laughs> but yeah, that's probably the only night. <laughs> There's a cue to cut Natalie out of yes. the costume. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he never has to ask for help for some reason. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you're odd to this a little because I grew up on a farm. And the only time I have smelt something that smells like my costume after six years is when I go into a, like a like a sty of pigs. <laughs> I can literally smell my costume from like three years away. Your costume smells so like a sty of pigs. <laughs> what were you doing in it? <laughs> Did you have to be sniffed out? I do everything too. in my costume. Well, costume. that you be sniffed out. <laughs> I mean, every year they just they add a different layer to mine every year to make me sweat slightly more, you know. But you know it smells like death. Have you ever smelled death? I, like, oh, I can smell some face feelers away. I used to like spray cheap after cheap over it. It's horrible. Anyway. Hi guys. TMI. Hello guys. Um, I want to thank. I've had the blessing and luck of meeting different one of you guys each throughout the year. Thank you for the fan service and. I want to know it. Which crowd is crazier? The Game of Thrones crowd or Star Wars? <laughs> People always ask me this. And I can't really, I, I mean, I should have come up with a better answer by now, really. There's absolutely no excuse. Um, I don't think it's a, I mean, it's not really a craziness, but the level of passion is pretty much equal. And I'm hugely lucky to be involved with both projects, to be involved with a project. What is noticeable is Star Wars is something that many of us have grown up with, that gives us actually, what I feel is a sense of hope about Star Wars. That's how I feel. I feel like I've come home. And it's amazing the way Game of Thrones is seven, we're going into the seventh season now. But there's a similar feeling, actually, which I think is a match of, of the passion and love. And I look forward to the resonance of Game of Thrones carrying on through people's lives so they still have, they have that same feeling of, of home and love for it. Show on television right now. It's 
Sophie. Um, How is your relationship with your with John now that you've reunited? And also, since you're running low on brothers lately, <laughs> I have a proposition for you. Can I be a Stark? Yeah, you can. You're a Stark. Easy as that. See, I didn't realize it was that easy to replace brothers. Um, uh, first question was, oh, right, um, John and Sansa. Uh, I've forgotten the question. What was it? Does anyone remember the question? Fight together again. That's Fight together good. again. How does it feel? Oh, that's right. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's still that kind of sibling rivalry from back when they were very young and they reunited and, um, there's still kind of those, those kind of that sexism that's just ingrained in the culture where the men are the, the fighting figures and the women just kind of say nothing. When really Sansa is politically, especially to do with Battle of the Bastards, was very um, she was very knowledgeable about how to deal with the situation, deal with the Boltons, and so it's about them finding that balance um, and finding that collaboration, but it, it's it's proving quite difficult. He's the military man, she's the politician, but I think they both need to realize that they need to stop fighting for ultimate power and just work together. Thank you very much. Uh -oh. Oh. Your ideals. 
And you think that's going to happen with torment? <laughs> yeah, mutual Well, it's not going to happen right. to you. Oh! oh! Thank you. 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 Thank you.